This is the Alhambra Investments Weekly Market Pulse. Joe Calhoun is here. And this week, Joe, uh, in your written report, you said that you're, you're asking some questions. So let me set the stage. Uh, number one, stock prices are at near, uh, near highs, all-time highs. We've got a gallery full of pessimists. We've got a ton of economic skepticism. And we've got this boatload of pundits who think they have the answer for all time that is correct. So you're asking questions. And, and so let's, let's go through uh, a few of those today. And, and uh, if you're watching and you want to see all the questions, I'm going to put the link in the information section uh, down below. Um, but let's start. Um, first, Joe, will the economy continue to slow? Well, first of all, let me just say I'm always full of questions. <laughs> I don't have lots of answers, but I've got lots of questions. And I think it's really important to ask the right questions. So will the economy continue to slow? Well, look, first of all, we, we got this right. Uh, we observed that interest rates were falling from their peak back in the spring. And we said that means the economy or expectations for growth are falling. And ultimately, that real growth will follow suit. And it did. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that the economy slowed. I think everybody agrees with that. But interest rates have started to uh, or at least have, have stopped going down. Now, whether we can say they're back in an uptrend or not, I, I think that depends on your perspective. If you're looking over the last year, you could say uh, the 10-year Treasury note yield has doubled. And it sounds like it's an uptrend to me. Uh, but if you're measuring since April, then they're you know down from 175 to 135. So uh, it depends on your perspective. I, I tend to think that we are still in an uptrend. So will the economy continue to slow? Well, I don't know. I, the market seems to be saying that we've we priced in the slowing that the market expected here, and so now I think it's kind of dependent on on how things proceed from here. Uh, what are you going to see from Delta, the Delta variant, which looks like it's peaking? What are you going to see in policy from the Biden administration? Are you going to see them try to push through uh, these tax hikes and so forth? There's already been a lot of pushback uh, from the moderates in, in the House and Joe Manchin in, in, in the Senate that the price tag is too high and that the tax increases are too much. We'll see where they all come out. So all these things are going to start to impact how people think, how traders think about the economy going forward. And that will have an impact on interest rates. And it will tell us whether the economy is going to continue to slow. So the answer is I don't have an answer yet. Uh, I'm watching the market to see if the market will provide that answer. And it usually does. All right. Question number two, what are the long-term impacts of COVID on the labor market? Yeah, look, this is one that I don't think we're going to know the answer for years and, and maybe even decades. I am fascinated by what's going on in the, in the labor market. You know, I think a lot of people just look at this stuff and go, well, that's negative. Uh, you know, the participation rate is not going back up. The employment to population ratio is, is, is very low and, and, you know, back to 1970s levels uh, for the participation rate. Uh, but prior to the big influx of women into the workforce, but, you know, if you think back to the 1970s, why did that participation rate go up? Why did women enter the workforce? Well, frankly, while uh, I think there were uh, some impediments to women advancing in the workforce back then, quite frankly, most women went to work back then because they had to. We had inflation that meant that a one income uh, household really didn't work anymore. So if we go back to one income households or some one income households or a uh, fewer people are going back to work. And by the way, the participation rate right now, kind of the cause of it is not that women are not going back to work. It's that men are not going back to work. So it's very, very strange what's going on there. Um, obviously, uh, things with schools and so forth is having an impact on families and how they view work and how they integrate work and family. It, it is just fascinating to me. Uh, I also talk in the piece about how we've seen this big surge in new business formations. A lot of people are quitting their job and going opening new companies, and, and, and they're going to be doing something. We don't know what it is. We, they're, they're going to be entrepreneurs. I've heard this over and over that, oh, well, that's just people going from employees to a contractor uh, type position. But I tell you what, when you dig in the details, that's not what it is. Those things would most likely be classified under professional services uh, in, 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 you know, in the way the government classifies these things. But that's not where most of the growth is. The growth in these new business formations across, is across a gamut of industries. 
yeah, some of it is retail. Uh, believe it or not, a huge number is or a large, not a huge number, a large number of it is, is retail, which may be nothing more than people trying to resell stuff on Amazon. I'm not or on, on, on eBay or Etsy. I don't know what it is. But, you know, we also see an increase there in manufacturing startups. There are just a, a plethora of things going on underneath the surface here that I don't think we really understand yet. Look, we know that new businesses fail at a high rate. And it may be that a lot of these companies and a lot of these people that are starting these companies are going to fail. But you know what? Failure teaches. There's nothing wrong with failure. Uh, it is uh, kind of the American way. We give second chances here. And so I, I think it's wonderful that people are getting out and trying and flexing their entrepreneurial muscles. I think it's fantastic. And I don't know what the impact is going to be. I suspect it's going to be positive. And again, if you look back at history, uh, we see that periods like this of stress often are very innovative times. And I don't think this one's going to be any different. So look, we hate uh, the fact that we ended up with this virus. Uh, it's killed a lot of people. It's affected a lot of families. It's had a, a negative impact in that sense. But ultimately, there may be something good that comes out of it. And I, I, I just I can't wait to see what the results are. You know, I said as we began that stacks, stocks are at a, a near all time high. So one of the other questions that you're asking, are stocks as expensive as they seem to be? Well, that's, a, again, a question we don't have an answer for. Look, it depends on, on, on corporate earnings growth. Or if you're thinking about the S&P 500, it's not really just overall corporate earnings growth, but growth of earnings in the S&P 500, which last quarter set a record. Uh, look, uh, we don't we would have to see some type of reacceleration in economic growth over a longer period of time for these multiples to make sense. And, and even then, I'm not sure they do. Uh, look, the multiples are very, very high if you're looking at large cap stocks. On the other hand, if you look at small and mid caps, uh, looking at the Russell 2000 or uh, the, uh, you know, the S&P 400, where, you know, the, the mid cap sector, they're not nearly as expensive. Um, so maybe it's just that we have this pocket of overvaluation in the S&P 500. And even there, we can't say for certain that they're overvalued because we don't know what future growth is going to be. We don't know what future earnings growth is going to be. If you compare them to history, you compare them to international markets, you compare them to small caps and mid caps, as, you know, U.S. large cap stocks look expensive. Uh, you can only know for sure with retrospect by looking back. Uh, right now, they look expensive. And I think that in most cases, we're going to try to avoid them. I would say, too, by the way, that there's a big difference between the growth index and the value index. The value index for the S&P 500 trades for roughly 16 times earnings, which is kind of high for value, but it's not extraordinarily high. Uh, the growth part trades at 24, 25, 26 times or whatever the number is. It's, it's a big number. So it is the growth part. And I think that that growth versus value uh, argument is I personally think growth is peaking against value. It's taking a long time. But, you know, growth outperformed value for such a long time. It makes sense that it would take a long time for the transition back to value. Uh, people don't stop doing what they're doing overnight. It takes time for them to, to understand that they need to be switching. So, again, uh, answers? Yeah, I don't have any. I, I don't know for sure. Um, but I, I, I think that maybe we need to be uh, less sure of ourselves when we're looking at valuations, put it that way. Last question I'm going to ask you today, one that you're pondering, where are we in the business cycle? Okay, so this is one where uh, after 2008, one of the things I thought about a lot was the next cycle. And I read something back then, and I don't even remember, I don't remember where I read it, but it made a lot of sense to me, especially coming from an engineering background which was that if the government intervenes in the economy, whether it's through fiscal policy or monetary policy, and Jeff has talked about this, by the way, about cutting off the bottom of the, uh, of the cycle, uh, sh making the recession shallower. Uh, and his argument has been, and I think it's right, that you can't cut off the bottom without cutting off the top too. So in other words, you can reduce the, the depth of the reception, recession but by doing so, you're going to also limit the peak of the next cycle. So to me, I started thinking about that. And to me, it sounds like if you think of the, the, the economy like a sine wave, if you compress the amplitude, okay, you compress the amplitude, what you're doing is increasing the wavelength. And so my thought back then was we're going to have a really long cycle. It's probably going to be slow growth, but it's going to be really long. Well, 
I think, quite frankly, I've been doing this for 30 years. It's one of my best predictions ever. And you know I don't like predictions. I, I'm not big on that. But that made perfect sense to me. So if you think about the amount of government intervention we had in 2008, 2009, and think about the amount of government intervention we've had now after COVID, quite frankly, I think COVID intervention has been even greater. And that's why, by the way, I have thought for, for a long time that what or since COVID really started is that we would come out of this with a lot more debt and a slower growth rate. Our trend growth coming into this was 2.2. My guess is we come out you know, 2%, 1.9, whatever it is, it's going to be lower. And it's also going to be a really long cycle. So when people start talking about, hey, interest rates have already peaked, yeah, I don't think so. I, I think we could be in this expansion cycle for a long time. Uh, ultimately, and I've said this in some of the things I've written, I think ultimately the 10 year is probably going to peak at a lower rate again. And my guess is somewhere around two and a half. We, we, we peaked last time at three and a quarter in the last cycle. This time, I think we peak at a lower number, two and a half, because there's kind of a natural limit there. Interest rates can only go up so far before we start having problems with the economy because we've got a lot of debt. The flip side of that, though, is that if you're going at a slower pace, it doesn't take much of a shock to knock you into recession. So it could be a very long cycle or it could be a cycle marked by a number of kind of mini recessions. I don't really know the answer to that yet, but I suspect that we are not near the end of this cycle, that we've still got a long way to go. Um, but again, I wait for the market to tell me. And uh, so we'll see. Uh, I hope it is a long cycle, but I would like to see higher growth. And that's where the interaction of that government intervention versus the optimism that we see from all these new business formations, how that all plays out and what the ultimate growth rate is. Uh, it, it's going to be really, really interesting 10 years, put it that way.